everyone welcome back to history 104 in this lecture we're going to address the great depression so i think the book does a really good job addressing the political right and the legislative aspect of the new deal so i'm not going to spend too much time on that though i'll briefly touch maybe on certain aspects here and there but rather <clears throat> the focus of this lecture will be on hoover because the book doesn't um, delve too deep into him, and also on culture of the uh, Great Depression. So we'll be examining things like food and and film and stuff like that. Not again, not in great detail, but just to give you an idea of how the Great Depression shapes the culture, right? It shapes people's uh, experiences and um, and how they react to that. So typically when we talk about the Great Depression, you know, we talk about things like organized crime uh, in regards to the social aspect. So if if you're um, like into mafia stuff, there's a lot of documentaries out there, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. And another thing that we touch on, or at least, you know, some historians touch on is an unorganized crime. And there you have people like Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, right? Uh, obviously those do have a probably much more direct connection with the Great Depression than say organized crime than the mafia, uh, particularly because many of these people uh, are struggling to survive. So they do all these things to, to you know, make money. And some of them, you know, do end up helping um, some of these poor working class people. Um, for example, Bonnie and Clyde, right, that when they rob a bank, they either give money to, you know, uh, poor people or, or they rip up deeds, at, you know, from banks so people can keep their homes. So, you know, that's, that's an interesting story unto itself. <clears throat> Another uh, thing that we will not touch on, though it is important, is the idea of working class protests during the Great Depression. Typically, we would think that during the Great Depression, people are competing for jobs, so you wouldn't have a lot of union movements. And it's quite the opposite. It's in the Great Depression where you do have a lot of things like wildcat strikes, people organizing into union drives. Um, and probably most importantly is that what we see is cross-racial organizing. Understand that Prior to this period, when it came to labor, I think I might have mentioned this in the previous lecture, uh, employers try to separate their workforce by, by race, and then, you know, they would have to compete. Um, so they put African Americans with African Americans in certain part of an industry. They, uh, you know, Mexican Americans, uh, Eastern Europeans, like Italian Americans, and so forth, right? And they would use this tactic to basically have each other compete, uh, which with other groups trying to speed up the, the process. In the 1930s though, what we see is quite the opposite. Instead of having these kind of divided groups, um, we find that different ethnic groups are actually coming together and unionizing together. A lot of it's through the CIO. Uh, I believe the book might have talked about that, that labor organization. So. Um, this is part of that process of becoming American, whereas before they might have been hyphenated Americans, right? African Americans, Italian Americans, Jewish American, Russian American, German Americans. Now, uh, by the 1930s, they're coming together as a cohesive group and really fighting the bigger enemy, which is their employer. So that's an interesting story. Uh, again, I won't touch on that. There's a great book. Um, geez, I just slipped my mind. Uh, it's based in Chicago and basically kind of explain how Americans became Americans, uh, particularly this hyphenated, gen hyphenated generation. And then another, another interesting fact about the Great Depression is this is where the, the term, the American dream is coined. In 1931, um, we have the creation of this concept called the American dream, which is funny only because it's coined in the midst of the Great Depression. And it's a historian, I think he's a, he's a student of Frederick Jackson Turner, who comes up with the, the idea of the American dream. And most of, us, most of us perceive it with kind of material wealth. And definitely there's an element of that, right? Moving up social classes and, and having certain material 
things that will put you into that economic class. But he goes a little bit deeper as to what is the American dream. And, and I would uh, recommend reading his book uh, because it really kind of challenged that perception that we typically have with the American dream. But it is quite interesting that it was invented right in the midst of the Great Depression. So what will be what will we be looking at? So we're going to look at that concept of the American dream somewhat. Um, to some extent, challenge it more than anything. Like we talked about rugged individualism in the back, uh, in, in in the uh, in the past, and um, show you how <clears throat> you know America tried to revive that concept of that rugged individualism in the midst of the Great Depression. We're going to address culture and also food during this period. And here in this picture, you see the the long. You know, bread lines, soup lines, right? People waiting to, to get fed in, in an economic downturn. So the objectives for this class is number one is address Hoover. You know, Hoover gets probably the brunt of the blame for the Great Depression. He obviously does play an important role in all this. Um, but we're going to, like a, like a revi revisionist historian, right? We're going to revise his role and um, not to make him look any better, but maybe <laughs> there'll be a hint of that, right? Yeah, he's, he's, he's not the greatest president during this time uh, to help about situation. You know, you have presidents throughout American history where, you know, they step up to the plate and they do great jobs. And then you have other presidents um, that unfortunately just are out of their depth, right? And, and we've seen this within within our lifetime, um, right? So Hoover, again, he's one of these people uh, that people love to hate, but um, you know, we'll, we'll look at him. You know, give, give him another look, I guess, right? Uh, we're going to explain the cultural shift from the 1920s to the 1930s, uh, focusing on things like food and, um, and music and stuff like that. And you know, how was culture changing in the midst of the Great Depression. And this will actually shape the 1950s. When we cover the 1950s, the concept of the American dream, the way we perceive it, is really a reflection of what many of these people went through in the 1930s. Remember, that's, that's a 20-year 20, 20 period. So if you were young in the 1920s, uh, sorry, in the 1930s, growing up in the Great Depression, you grew up with very little. So when the 1950s come around where you have this kind of really growing middle class, I think it's like 60% per of the people are middle class, all of a sudden you have this uh, ability to get the things that you wanted. So it is a, a time where Americans feel like, you know, they're trying to live vicariously through their kids um, in regards to giving them the things that they did not have growing up. And then lastly, we're going to address how uh, popular culture reflected the reality and the dreams during the Great Depression. So, uh, again, through music or, or through film, we see people struggle. But within such, um, such um, material, we find that people, uh, particularly the people who are producing it, try to show a much more positive light on things. <clears throat> so, life really sucked. But Hollywood try to put a positive spin on those, on those things, right? Uh, it's you know true in any era when times are hard. If you can remember the recession of 2000, 2007 and Barack Obama was president, and you know people were struggling, and you know he kept on promoting this thing called hope, right? And 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 people really. Um, really wanted to believe that and obviously the economy eventually re, um, improved but you know those were some hard years and and you could see the same thing with with um covid in 20 2020 how people were struggling and in order to try to survive this horrible you know pandemic people wanted to find some form of escapism 
right? They would go to movies or, you know, the movies tend to have a positive note, not so much about COVID, but, you know, just something that would get you away from this journey, you know, this kind of horrible experience that you were living. And that's what Hollywood does, right? It's like a, like a Disneyland that you can watch. The Great Depression was no different at this time. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, Hoover. Uh, Hoover, he's quite significant. Here's a picture of him because he's actually a progressive and he really embodies those ideals of, you know, the rugged individual. He was an orphan. He was orphaned, sorry, at the age of nine. Um, and, you know, he, he had a, he had to, um, at least from his perspective and his biography, he, he really needed to do what he needed to do in order to survive. Now understand that during the great depression, people, um, you know, uh, and, and the book talks about this, but people were struggling because it was the biggest economic c catastrophe that America had ever faced. So we had uh, undergone recessions and we talked about the one in the 1890s, right? But nothing at this level. Um, some people believe, and people like Hoover, and, and prob probably because he was you know, president at the time, but he also needed to play cheerleader, you know, they believe that this was going to be something that was going to be short-lived. <clears throat> you know, again, we could look at COVID, right? A lot of people thought, oh, well, within a year, it'll be over. And, um, you know, so people were somewhat optimistic, like, yeah, this is a short downturn, but things will, will, um, will get better. However, we find that there was a 25% unemployment in the United States. So the book talks about this particular point, right? Where manufacturing completely declined. So imagine one out of every four people that was employable did not have a job. Um, that's a lot, right? That's stuff that you don't see in any kind of Western country at this time. And, and remember, that's not to just the United States. It's all over the world that people are struggling. <clears throat> However, what the book doesn't talk about is this, that there's another 25% of people that are underemployed. So, uh, you know, one out of every four persons out of a job, but then you have the people that are working that are making nowhere near what they ought to be making, right? So you have workers' um, wages being cut. Uh, there was an increase in part-time workers, so people tend to be working more jobs. We see people that tended to classify being, uh, that used to be classified as professionals, more like white-collar jobs, uh, begin to enter lower pay industries. And this is something I remember from 2007 during the Great Recession, where uh, typically, and, and I don't mean to stereotype here, but typically when we hire admin assistants, they always tend to be women um, where, where I work here at EMCC. And this year, not only did we have, I mean, we would have like maybe 20 applicants at most, you know, before the Great Recession. But that time, during that time, we ended up having like over, I think over a hundred applicants. And then you tend to see a lot more men apply than you typically would see. Again, I'm not saying that these are only women, you know, didn't do these jobs, but rather you just don't see it in great numbers. Um, um, you don't see men in great numbers applying for these type of jobs uh, beforehand. And then all of a sudden during the Great Recession, you, you just see the, an explosion of both applicants and also male trying to enter this field that they typically would have not had entered. And I think a lot of them just say, I'll do this temporarily uh, until the economy improves. And then they probably would have, would have left. Um, again, I don't mean to be sexist, but that's just the way the, you know, the, the kind of statistics played out. All right. <clears throat> we find that college students in the 1930s uh, were working in a lot of service industry jobs, right? People who had college degrees could not get good paying jobs. <clears throat> we see people's wages, as I mentioned, right, uh, decrease uh, so much that people essentially could not, pay, could not pay bills. So property taxes went unpaid. 
which had a trickle down impact to the community because that meant that teachers could not be paid, that po a police force could not be paid, that fire fighters could not be paid, right? So you do see that this, um, you know, even people that are working are not making enough that they can't pay the bill. So this ripples throughout the community. Uh, people who took out loans from banks um, needed to pay those back. Banks had a, you know, started calling in their loans. But again, most people had no money to pay them. So a lot of banks failed. <clears throat> and I think I mentioned this in the past that, you know, today, you know, even with the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, um, it wasn't a depression, right? And it's because the federal government plays such an important role and trying to uplift as many industries as it can. Now, it can't do everything, but um, it, it does what it can. And it's during the New Deal where we see uh, government kind of protecting banks, right? So they wouldn't fail. So, you know, prior to the New Deal and Roosevelt, uh, and again, the book talks about this, but there was a major bank failure across the United States. And then we find that, you know, homelessness and bread lines, as I showed you in the original picture from this presentation, uh, increase in, in great numbers. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in, in a while. <clears throat> so going back to Hoover, again, he, he, he really wanted to do a hands-off approach when it came to the economy because he believed in this concept of what we would call today small government, right? Uh, the government is not even a referee <laughs> during this time, right? The government doesn't intervene in economic situations. And a lot of it relates back to the way he, he grew up. As I said, he, he was an orphan. Um, he was born into poverty. However, he, again, epitomizes that, that rugged individualism where he graduated from Stanford University and made his fortune as an engineer. He did have a Quaker... Um, background where there's this kind of mentality that you know you help people where you can but you help through charity not through the government he believed in American individualism and the idea that government should not hand things out that idea repelled him he, he did not believe government should play a role in helping people um, once he was president, the, the depression hit fairly quickly within his tenure. He refused to take a salary uh, as president and donated a lot of his money to, um, to relief organizations. So he believed, again, that through charity, you could do, you could fix these major issues and help people out. Um, and this kind of goes back uh, to his background, not only, you know, again, being orphaned and pulling himself by the bootstrap, if you will, right, kind of argument. But during World War I, uh, where uh, he was living in London, um, where he helped Americans obtain relief. And then he went to Belgium and he founded and became the chairman of the Commission for Relief in Belgium. And there he gave food to those that were trapped between France and Germany during the war. So after this role, he became somewhat of a of a hero, not like a military hero, but a humanitarian hero, hence the name, right? The great humanitarian. So this would kind of shape um, that that idea of, you know, let government, don't let government step in, but rather let, you know, charities come in and help. So I already kind of talked about this rugged individualism, right? That, again, he believed that, um, he was the embodiment of that concept and that government should not step in. <clears throat> now, his role while he was president and the Great Depression, we find that he had to take an active role as president of the United States which meant that government needed to take an active role because people were struggling. So 
um, as I mentioned earlier, he was a reformist and he actually did make, uh, like implemented certain policies during the Great Depression. Nothing like the New Deal, but um, it was the beginning of what we would call bigger government. So a lot of people don't see Hoover as part of that bigger government, but in reality, he, he almost had no choice. So just to give you some examples, um, his response to the Great Depression um, varied in different ways, but here are just some things that he did. You know, he redirected the Department of Justice to go after organized crime. He directed them to go after Al Capone, and you see things like the FBI, right, and the Untouchables going after Capone, uh, and organized crime just in general. He created the Federal Farm Board to help farmers with government price support. He expanded tax cuts across all income classes. That way more people can have money in their pocket. The, you know, theoretically, he wanted that money to be spent and stimulate the economy. He set aside federal funds to clean up slums in major cities. So again, this is federal funds, gov you know, government funds to help individual communities. He created the Veterans Administration and expanded the Veterans Hospitals. He established the Federal Bureau of Prisons to oversee incarceration uh, conditions nationwide. Again, here we see a great example of bigger government, right? Making sure prisons are, are following the law. And he, and he even proposed an old age pension program, promising $50 a month to all Americans over the age of 65. And to some extent, that's the precursor to Social Security, right? So, um, you know, he did start the ball rolling so much so that um, Franklin, um, an advisor to Franklin Roosevelt stated, uh, quote, we didn't admit it at the time, but practically the whole New Deal was extrapolated from programs that Hoover started said Rexford Tugwell, who was, a, like I said, a key advisor to FDR. So uh, it, it, it's so interesting, right, that again, we see Republican as, as hands off government uh, or hands off the economy. Yet, um, to some extent, we can almost link it back to Hoover for starting a Republican who started big government and just, you know, FDR kind of ran with it. Um, however, Hoover did tell Americans, you know, you need to tighten your belts and work harder, right? Um, because he he knew things were going to get hard, right? He also asked Congress to pass a uh, 160 million tax cut, and I kind of mentioned that earlier. But again, the idea is that government is playing a big role. Sorry, didn't have these, that bullet point there, right? Bigger government. So he kind of, to some extent, um, if when we talk about origin stories of big government, we can go back to this Republican here that basically started big government in the U.S. Now, when it came to poverty in America um, and Hoover, um, we find that, you know, like we said, a quarter of the population is unemployed. And Hoover's name gets associated with poverty, right? Um, Hoovervilles, Hoover blankets, and Hoover flags. So let's talk about <clears throat> what this stuff means. So. Hoovervilles, yeah, I'm not sure the book touches on this. I think it does, but you know, these were the kind of shanty towns that emerged um, throughout the United States. People, you know, get kicked out of their homes. They need to, they're still alive. They need to live somewhere, so they built their own homes. And you know, these are better homes than than maybe modern day because they they had those skills. You know, they're not great, but they did what they could. And, um, you know, they became little kind of shanty towns across the United States. So, um, unfortunately, Hoover's name gets associated with, with these poor communities. Uh, Hoover blankets, you can see the picture right here, right? A Hoover blanket was a, um, a newspaper, right? <laughs> that people uh, used to, to warm themselves up with um, and, and cover themselves. And then lastly, you have the Hoover flags and Hoover flags were basically when, you know, people will pull their pockets um, from their pants, right? They pull them out. And obviously, you know, the, 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 the pockets would kind of dangle over there, right? And that would be a Hoover flag because people had no money 
Uh, so a lot of it was a critique of the Hoover, I guess the, the perception of Hoover, right? That he did nothing to, to help the American people. So, you know, this, this did um, definitely have a negative impact on Hoover's legacy. Because obviously he's not reelected and FDR comes in. And even though FDR did not um, fix the situation, uh, a lot of his programs have a long lasting impact even to today, right? Social security and so forth and so on. <clears throat> now, as I said, people start um, struggle and we find that, um, you know, starvation was a concern, maybe not so much for the poor, right? If you're already poor before the Great Depression, you really don't want company, right? Um, so, you know, the poor knew how to survive, but it's really the middle class, those people that were, you know, somewhat well off, maybe had a home, had a car, had that material um, stuff that all of a sudden they lost it all. And now they, they had nothing and they needed to survive, right? So... As I mentioned earlier with Hoover, the belief was that charities could fix the problem. And we find that this situation was way too massive for a charity to try to resolve, right? And it got to the point that even the Red Cross, the Red Cross was asked to help. And the Red Cross said, you know, they could not. The chairman noted that, quote unquote, unemployment was a, not an act of God, but rather an act of man, right? And... When it comes to rugged individualism, again, the belief is that you pull yourself up, right? That you work hard and eventually you'll succeed. But what happens when it's not your fault, right? When it's an economic, if not, it's a global issue, right? You have almost no choice but um, to feel depression outside from the economic depression, but you feel depression yourself. So people were, were hit and, you know, pretty hard. We find that bread lines and soup kitchens became a common sight throughout American cities. Um, just for example, in New York, by 1932, they had 32 soup kitchens that served 85,000 meals daily, right? Uh, that's a lot, right? <laughs> Even Al Capone participated in soup kitchens, you know, which gave them you know, great PR during the, the Great Depression. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Al Capone is, he's a very famous gangster. He was probably the most well-known American um, for for a lot of decades. You know, and you go anywhere in the world and say his name, and people knew him more than any other American um, at that time. Um, we find that a lot of kids would enter middle-class neighborhoods uh, to go around begging or scavenge for food in trash cans. This was a very common sight. Uh, I mean the Middle class does, does not completely collapse, but they're not as big as, as they were. Not that they were that big anyways to begin with, but a lot of people are going to these neighborhoods, you know, uh, particularly sending their kids because people are proud, right? People are ashamed to go ask for, for food and they feel like their kids can probably get away with, with more. And when it comes to hunger and, and starvation, uh, one kid said, you know, you quote, you get used to hunger. After the first few days, it doesn't even hurt. I mean, this is just kind of sad, right? Uh, you just get weak, uh, unquote, right? So it, it, it's a pretty sad experience. But, you know, um, a lot of times we want to believe in the American can-do attitude. And it's not so much the American can-do attitude. It's just reality, right? People are going to live through poverty. That's just a fact of life. It has nothing to do with America because people were doing the same thing everywhere else in the world, right? Struggling to survive. In 1931, when it comes to starvation, uh, in 1931, 20, there were 20 documented cases of starvation. In 1934, that had increased to 110 cases. So people you know, did die from starvation, unfortunately. But as I mentioned, right, people learned to be poor. Um, you know, different ways that people, you know, different things that people did to survive, number one, one person would stay idle in, in order to preserve energy, uh, therefore lowering uh, his or her food consumption, right? They would, you know, the less you move, the less hungry you're going to be. Uh, 
uh, you know, people started to eat parts of animals that they probably wouldn't eat before, right? Or that they would probably discard in the past. Uh, a great example of that is, you know, liver, liver and onion, right? So if you, I'm not sure if anybody here has ever tasted liver and onions, but a lot of times you could take, probably talk to your great grandparents or, or grandparents. And, you know, that was, you know, they grew to, to like it basically, because that's all they had. That's all they had to eat. And it was fairly nutritious too, right? And it is noted that uh, in one example, one young girl that, uh, that was so hungry was told to go home from school and, and she was told to go eat. And she replied, quote, I can't, it's my sister's turn to eat, unquote, right? So uh, it just shows again how people learn to be poor, right? Learn to struggle. So, um, like I said earlier, it has no, nothing to do with America, like American ideology, but rather just people's you know, learn how to survive. <clears throat> and I'm sure you can go to Europe, Canada, Mexico, right, China, whatever, right? You go any part in the world and you probably would see the same type of story, right? So again, it has nothing to do with American individualism or rugged individualism or whatever, right? When it comes to charity, um, a question, you know, that we have to ask is like, well, why didn't charity work, right? Why didn't charity get us out of this depression? Well, government believed that aid should come from charities during this period, right? Again, this is during the Hoover administration. Uh, so here we're focusing between 1828 and uh, sorry, 1928 and 1932. And, you know, again, they believe that charities could fix the, at least help for the Great Depression. However, when it came to charities, again, with unemployment and underemployment being so high, it meant that people had nothing to give to charities. So how can a charity help when they themselves are not getting the type of resources that they were receiving prior to the Great Depression? So there's no way a great charity is going to fix anything, right? Uh, we find that states tried to help, but they couldn't. You know, some states did implement some form of charity, at least some kind of aid, kind of, I guess what we would call today welfare. New York would give some families an allowance of $2.39 a week. Um, Detroit, they gave 15 cents a day to, um, to people, but that money quickly ran out right uh, it, it was not sustainable so we find that again charity um during the hoover years was not going to do enough even if it was being provided by by the state again you know people are not paying taxes at this time so the the state is not does not have any revenue to give out we find school teachers um even though you know again teachers wages were being cut and you know we know this today, right? Teachers don't get paid much anyway. Um, we find that they were able to collect um, a total of about $250,000 a month um, from their personal salaries to help needy children, right? So the people that did have a job, um, particularly teachers, right? Um, people who are underpaid did what they could to help the community. And we also have to remember that today, if you remember COVID when it first, ha uh, first hit and people were losing their job uh, and, and they needed food, they would go you know, to downtown Phoenix and you know, drive their car up and, and you know, there were these food banks just putting boxes of food into their, their trunks, right? Which is, which is great, you know, no questions asked boom, here's some food, you know, go, go feed yourself. I mean, it didn't matter if you're rich or poor, you know, you needed help, you know, the charity was there to help you. Back in the eight, 1930s, even further back, but, you know, up to this point too, we find that charities were very restrictive. You could only obtain it if you were part of the needy poor based on the, on the standards of the community, Right. So certain people would not qualify. And this is an age where, you know, people still live in small towns or, you know, people knew your business. So we find like single mothers were denied, right? Because they were not chased, right? Uh, 
uh, alcoholics were denied, right? Or at least people that perceived to be alcoholics. So anybody that society deem as, you know, a problem of any sorts, they would not be given charity. So you had to meet a certain criteria. A lot of times men um, were, would not be would not qualify for charity because the expectation is that you should be working right so uh, a lot of times you know men would not ask for charity not only because of that but also because of this concept that we called shame right a lot of them were ashamed that they could not provide for their families so we find that the concept of shame evolves from the 1920s to 1930s whereas in the 1920s Shame was associated with really personal failure, right? Failure was your own fault, which was a, 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 a character issue. Because of the vastness of the Great Depression and, and the way it impacts everybody, we find that shame evolves in the 1930s because this was an economic collapse, right? That was so massive. How could it be your fault, right? This is a global issue that was out of your control. Right. It wasn't your fault you were poor. It wasn't your fault that the economy tanked. So we find how shame be, you know, gets um, redefined in the Great Depression. <clears throat> Even then, men typically would not ask for help, right? Because again, they were proud and many of them are coming from the 1930s where again, they feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a failure as a man. Um, but particularly for families when everything failed, even though the, the male um, head of household would not, would not ask for help, the, uh, you know, the, the woman in the household had no problem going to a charity and asking for food so they can support their family, particularly their kids. So uh, it is quite interesting. Again, today we have probably gone back to the concept of shame from the 1920s where we see it as a personal issue, right? Where failure is a personal issue that I felt because um, it's something I did, right? That there's no like other outside factors that shape that. Uh, when it comes to the family, we find that marriages and birth rates decline significantly. And, you know, a lot of times families would end up sending their kids, um, as we mentioned earlier, right? To middle class neighborhoods to go beg um, or they would just send them away to family members who were better off that way they don't have to provide for that child um, you know this is quite common <clears throat> so you know a lot of grown-ups again they were very shameful of asking for food of begging so you know um, by sending their kid to live with a relative who had a little bit more means or by having them go out there and beg this would kind of help the family unit. Uh, another thing that we see, because again, a lot of men are waiting to get married now. You know, they're they're just kind of living their life. I think the intro of the chapter introduces somebody who jumped the uh, uh, onto trains, and this actually creates somewhat. You know, there is you know, studies out there that talk about hobo culture, right? People just kind of vagabonding around the United States, jumping the tra the, the trains and going to different communities, trying to find any work to survive. It was also a, a time of adventure for them, right? Because all they had to do was support themselves. Some of them left their, their families altogether, right? To, to, live, this, to live this life. Um, but that was something common. And, and I wish I have read more about hobo culture because it does sound interesting, but there are books out there in case you're interested about hobo culture. Um, and when it came comes to family and poverty, as I mentioned earlier, right, the majority of families adapted to poverty because they always do, right? <laughs> Times are hard. You do what you have to do to survive. And as I mentioned, uh, it was the, you know, the former middle class, those people that came from the middle class, lost everything during the Depression. They were the ones who struggled the most to conform to this new form of poverty. Um, but they had no choice but to learn how. So things that they did, both, you know, again, the, the poor and the middle class uh, or the former middle class who are now poor, you know, they increase their, their gardening, right? They, they, they grow their own food rather than going out to eat. They can their own food. Again, many, maybe 
many of your grandparents or great grandparents have these uh you know these uh what do you call them um basements where they you know they they can and preserve fruit and things like that right jellies and because you just never know right one day you might end up poor right and and it's a mentality that they grow up with that they pass on to to their kids you know people wasted very little um and it's really you know the I, you could make the case that it's only because of women that we survive this great depression because they take the active role in doing these things right again the men are too proud but it's the women that are doing the hard work so when we talk about women we find that women um played a very important role and again here we're talking generally just i guess almost generically in the sense of you know i'm not talking about specific um, women but just women in regards to to large numbers here so women were forced to enter the workforce to supplement the family income right whereas before they may might have had the luxury to stay home they really felt like they had no choice but to enter the the economic sector to find work um, many men were not happy about this. Many men in companies were not happy because they have often argue that those jobs should go to men. But, you know, everybody's struggling to survive, so you have to do what you have to do. In 1930, we, we find that about 10 million women enter the workforce. By 1939, 13 million women were part of the workforce. And many of them began to enter what are called pink-collar jobs. Uh, they begin to dominate certain sectors of the job industry, such as telephone operators, social workers, and secretaries. Going back to my point about 2007, right? Um, when we were hiring an admin assistant. Uh, some states, uh, it's, sta it's noted that 26 states actually passed laws that limited married women from employment. Uh, again, the belief is that the men is the... Uh, the head of the household so he should have the primary job um, but again women find ways to circumvent that system and unfortunately when it came to when it came to african-american women they suffer the worst with a 50 percent unemployment rate whereas uh, united states as a whole was one quarter uh, african-american women were at 50 percent and a lot of times they were uh what do you call it they were pushed out of their jobs a lot of them were domestic workers Took care of kids and clean households and things like that uh they were the ones fired and replaced with white women who needed some of these jobs you know people of color struggle pretty pretty hard um with mexican-american uh people i guess in general uh, but obviously includes women uh many of them were actually deported it is noted about five hundred thousand mexican-american three quarters of them being u.s citizens were deported during the repatriation waves of the 1930s you know they were just rounded up and deported back to mexico so um you know people of color uh and including you know people of color uh women that were people of color suffered significantly during this period so let's talk about food during the great depression <clears throat> um we find that the community tried to do what it could to try to help people survive um we're talking about local governments right um different different cities sometimes they were off <clears throat> sorry offer free land to people and they would offer seed and tell them you know go grow something basically right go grow your crops live off the land um but there were conditions set um for them to to do these things so uh yes they had the land uh, but the land needed to be maintained or else they would they would lose that right um but again a lot of people took up this opportunity to to not only learn these skills but learn to survive basically so uh this was maybe a positive aspect of the great depression when it comes to food, there's actually a YouTube channel out there. I can't remember the, you could probably type it in like in Google, you know, food of the Great Depression, and I'm sure it will pop up. But you know, there's a lot of, um, this person has a lot of videos of, again, how food begins to change from say the 20s to the 30s and what people ate. And I'm briefly gonna talk 
about some of these things, you know, we find that a lot of the food recipes tended to be simple uh, only because they lacked the resources to you know, create really good tasteful food, right? Um, and people tend to buy, at least families, right, uh, you know, in order to feed themselves and, and their kids, needed to, uh, tended to buy goods that were plenty and cheap. So they would buy things that came basically in sacks. Think of Costco, maybe, right? In large quantities. So, you know, they would eat things like macaroni, um, where that came in, you know, 20, you know, I don't know how big they were, like, um, but they came in big sacks. And, um, you know, that would, that would last you a, a really long time. And it was cheap. So when they ate macaroni, it was they did not eat macaroni and, and cheese or anything like that because cheese would have been seen as a expensive luxury at that time. But they became very creative in how they cooked their macar macaroni. They, they probably developed a few couple of recipes so it doesn't feel like it's very repetitive day after day eating the same thing, right? Maybe you mash it up and make it into a like an oatmeal type thing, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever you need to do to make it seem like it's something different. Uh, potatoes were very healthy. So they would eat, um, you know, they had a lot of nu nutritious vitamins. So this became a major staple. Uh, beans, right? Beans is always a good depression food in the sense of, you know, during economic hard times, people tend to eat a lot of beans. Uh, I mean, some of these products are like things that we look down at today, right? You know, liver and onion and beans and things like that, right? So, uh, but yeah, beans was a good substitute for meat because people could not afford meat. Meat, again, was very expensive. Eggs was another kind of common food source because a lot of times people develop uh, their own chicken coops in their backyards, right? So they fed their chickens and they laid eggs and you have yourself um, some eggs there. And again, with eggs, they came, came up with a lot of interesting recipes for that. Another um, food staple that is interesting during the Great Depression, I think it's making a comeback, believe it or not. I watch a lot of Food Network and now it's become chic, right? But dandelions actually uh, become important part of, a, of your daily greens because number one, they're free, right? Dandelions just kind of grow out of, you know, they grow out like weeds. So you can just go out there and pick them and you don't have to, um, you know, quite hardy a hardy plant and you don't have to buy them right so dandelions was was used for salads and an interesting thing was um something that was called hoover stews tend to be very popular so again we talked about hoover blankets hoover fills here you have hoover stews and this again you can youtube it but this was like macaroni um with hot dogs so you chop up the dogs you add tomatoes, you add canned corn, and obviously you add water, and there you have a, a delicious um, stew that you can eat. And here you see people, right, just eating probably at a, at a soup kitchen. <clears throat> Another kind of connection that we see with food is uh, clothing during the Great Depression. Uh, one thing that's interesting, if you ever watch uh, like movies that are based in the 1920s and you look at clothing, Clo clothing tends to be really loose in the 1920s. Uh, obviously, they have the shorter skirts, right, up, up to the knee, around the knee area, but they, they're very boxy uh, and they're very loose and they could relate to the idea that, you know, you have a lot of material so you can make clothing a lot, you know, a lot looser than previous ages. But during the Great Depression, a lot of people don't have money to, to buy clothes. So fashion changes during the Great Depression. And you see it here with these young women uh, or you know, uh, young girls, I guess, right? Um, one thing that you notice is that it's fitted, right? A lot more fitted to the body, which again, that 1920s style begins to disappear and the clothing, you know, both for, for young girls, but also adults tends to be a lot more fitted to the body. Uh, young boys would have these very common overalls is what they would wear, right? Maybe because they're part of the farm too, but they were quite popular during this era. Um, but going back to women in regards to clothing, 
What tended to happen is that people would not buy clothing, but rather make their own clothing out of the sacks of food that they would buy. <laughs> so, um, you know, they would purchase these, these, um, you know, sacks of potatoes or pasta or whatever, flour. And out of that, you know, potato sack, they would make a, um, a dress. <laughs> so, and you can kind of see it here. I mean, I think most of these girls are probably or are actually wearing um, you know, flower sacks that get redesigned into a dress, right? There is a picture, I wish I would have found it, but of a young girl that actually wears, um, the dress that she's wearing has the label of the product you know, that was in that, in that sack. And, and you feel kind of sad for these you know, little girls um, because again, they're just struggling to survive and they're putting on whatever whatever they can and obviously kids grow quick so right you need to keep up with with them what ended up happening as companies began to hear that people were making their you know flower sacks uh, into clothing a lot of them started to put prints on the sacks instead of the label of the company they would put prints so they you know so people would purchase their their food and then they, you know, um, they would make clothes out of that. So it was also a bit of a marketing tactic for companies so they can grow their business by putting prints instead of the name of the brand or anything like that, because they knew people were going to make something out of that, that, um, that material. So I'm not sure if you knew that, but it is an interesting uh, story to the Great Depression. All right, so let's talk about great uh, pop culture. You know, how this culture began to change during the Great Depression. So we began by looking at photography. Um, really, those who were hard hit by the Great Depression. Dorothy Lang, probably the most famous photographer during the Great Depression, <clears throat> played a very important role in capturing what Americans were going through. Um, she actually suffered from polio, so she had a bit of a weird walk because of polio that she never really recovered from. And she felt that this actually play, played an important role in people trusting her, you know. Uh, she worked for the U.S. government to document farmers you know, and what they were going through. She was a, originally a portrait photographer. And um, she left that and joined the Farm Security Administration, which was part of the New Deal. So she traveled throughout the United States. Her famous are, her pictures are very famous. Um, but this one's probably the most famous one. And, and it's interesting because this one's from a small town called Nepomo, California. And I actually grew up by Nepomo. And I never knew it was from taken in that area until... Um, until I was in college and our teachers never talked about this photograph for some reason. So anyway, she stopped in the Pomo where she just felt she was being called to go into a, a, a camp that was there, you know, a, a camp of, of uh, farm pickers uh, in the middle of, I think it was winter because they were, they were struggling there in the cold. So she enters this camp and meets this woman, um, and takes this picture. So it's it's probably the most famous picture of the Great Depression. She actually takes a few, but this is the one that, that captured the attention of the United States. Now, this woman, her name is Florence Thompson. She's 32 years old, and she and her family are living off frozen peas and birds that they had killed. So, and you can see them, right, uh, how they're kind of struggling. Um, and the interesting thing about this picture, and uh, normally I would ask you to do an analysis and get your reaction, but um, you know, for the sake of time, we, we can kind of see some things really stand out here, right? Number one, she's 32 years old. And if you look at her face, my gosh, she looks like she's 50, right? So it really kind of shows how the depression, the Great Depression, um, basically just takes a life out of her, right? And this picture, she's actually uh, Florence Thompson, the, the person who, who's here. Um, 
you know, years later, you know, she was uh, contacted and she felt very ashamed about the publicity that this picture got. So, um, what ha you know, what does this picture tell us about the Great Depression? So, as I mentioned earlier, right, it's a story of a young woman that's beaten by the time by the time, uh, showing her much older than she, what she is. Her beauty has basically faded away due to poverty. And another thing that we see in regards to the photography and, and the talent of Dorothy Lang is the way she portrays this woman almost like a Madonna and child, right? As we can see down here, she has her baby wrapped in a blanket. And, but then, um, you know, she's there too. And if you ever look at old medieval pictures or Christian pictures, right, Catholic pictures, you always, you always see Madonna and child. And those tend to be a little bit more positive. Here you have almost that same kind of positioning, yet you get a very different message. Um, so in this particular picture, she did not pose. So Dorothy Lang was just taking kind of candid pictures um, and it is noted that she probably, this woman didn't even know that this picture was taken. But again, we see the poor kids again, struggling, trying to find refuge in her mother, yet her mother doesn't know how she's going to fix this. Right. And, and it really talks about, again, the way we see our parents, right? We look up to our parents as though they have all the answers. Uh, and you could kind of see that here, right? The kids cuddling next to their mom yet in her facial expression, it's an expression of despair, right? There's um, uncertainty as to how they're going to survive. Um, so uh, she almost feels in prison, as we talked about the concept of shame, right? That she feels responsible, even though it's not her fault that America is going through this, right? Or that she's going through this. So this is why this picture is so moving. What ended up happening in this story is that Dorothy Lang, um, after she stops at this camp and takes her pictures, she continues to San Francisco. Um, a newspaper gets wind of this. They publish this picture and the story. And they actually sent aid to this area. But by then she was she had already left. And, and from what I read, uh, you know, the kids grow up and they actually do really well. Again, they grow up in the 1950s. And, um, you know, they, they actually look, they talk very highly of their mother in regards to this moment because they feel like they gained some type of strength um, by this experience. And um, again, it's a very, very powerful picture. I hope nobody has to go through that, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a picture that represents the Great Depression so well. Another kind of, again, these are struggling times for Americans, right? Again, this photography captures that, but music does the same thing. And we see it with a very, very famous song called Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? I think hopefully you get a chance to go to the uh, beginning of the, of the module and you listen to the song where you hear the lyrics and, and the melody of, of the song. Um, it's it's uh, the example that I provided. It's it's a remake uh, by by George Michael, but I think he sings it really well, and he he does kind of capture that nineteen thirties feel. So this song, uh, "Brother, Can You Spare a Dime?" Hopefully, again, you listen to it. If not, take a minute, pause, and, and go listen to it. It's written by E. Y. Uh, Yip Harper, um, and he had gone bankrupt during the Great Depression, which to some extent, maybe it's a plus because this forced him to do something else, which is write music. And he becomes a very, uh, at least in the 30s and 40s, uh, uh, very important music writer, because not only did he write this song that kind of epitomizes the 1930s, but he also wrote Over the Rainbow, if you ever watched The Wizard of Oz. Um, he, he did support socialism. Um, because understand again, the Great Depression hits and capitalism essentially proved that it failed, right? And so a lot of people uh, in the book notes this, that a lot of people started to turn to socialism or communism as an alternative to capitalism. And uh, a lot of it's because again, 
a whole decade of poverty kind of shows you capital. You know, there are structural problems to capitalism uh, until the federal government steps in. Unfortunately, by the 1950s, he's part of the blacklisted group, right? Anybody who, during the Red Scare, anybody who's associated with the Communist Party gets blacklisted. Uh, the song itself comes from an experience that he and a friend went through. They were, I think they were writing the song and they didn't have a title for it. Um, but they were down, I think they're getting lunch or something like that. And some guy came up to them and asked them, um, hey, buddy, can you spare a dime? And this is something that kind of stuck with them. So when they you know, came back to complete the song, it obviously got included and became the title of the of the song. Now, the song itself addresses. So if you listen to it, you'll hear the, the lyrics and the lyrics address the experience of the Great Depression. Everything from the bread lines to the railroad system that you know people were getting fired and obviously people were jumping up and down off trains, right? Traveling in the United States. They talked about the sky, skyscrapers of the 1920s, right? That many of the workers helped build this. And now that they were no longer needed, they were kicked to the curb. And probably the most important one is the Bonus March Army. And the book talked about this, where these WW1 veterans, American vet, veterans, went to Washington to collect um, their bonus paycheck that they felt was owed to them, right? And they camp out against... Uh, against the president and then they send out MacArthur Eisenhower and Patton to attack their veterans right and again this is a conundrum that a lot of people don't speak about that these great military heroes of World War II uh, MacArthur Eisenhower and Patton uh, were attacking their fellow men right and, and there's just you know uh, you know people die and again you can read that in, in, in your textbook about what happened with the Bonus March Army, but, uh, you know, um, Herbert included this into his his song so Americans would not forget what the government did to the vets that were no longer needed, right? Because, again, they were from World War I. Um, now, this song in particular differed from, say, other songs during the era. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't want to call it propaganda, but, you know, it's... Basically, uh, Hollywood working with, you know, government and politicians to try to cheer people up, right? So um, other songs tended to be more positive to hide the despair that people were going through, right? So some of the other songs that were popular during the Great Depression were called On the Sunny Side of the Street, Life is a Bowl of Cherries, and Happy Days Are Here Again. And those were... Again, that sense of escapism to try to give hope to people where really there was very little hope to speak of, right? Uh, and another industry that did this probably better than, say, song music was the film industry. So the movie industry uh, tended to suffer during the Great Depression, just like every other industry. But it recovered quite quickly because people wanted an escape. Right. And for 25 cents, a movie would give you that escape. So what we find during the Great Depression, uh, sorry, movies before the Great Depression tend to reflect the values of individualism, self-reliance and material success through competition. Essentially, 1920 films reflected that American dream mentality. Right. However, uh, again, films of the depression tended not so much to do the opposite i mean they're still very uplifting um, but they tend to focus more on the welfare of the community um, and the importance of community right of people helping each other and you see it in in uh in films like um even though this is done in the 1940s um it's a wonderful life because the writers of that film grew up during the great depression and if you watch it's a wonderful life. It's not about individualism, right? Um, it's about community coming together to help this poor guy who is struggling, not because of things that he did, but things that were out of his control, right? Um, if you want to call it communism, call it communism. Um, I know it has a negative connotation when we talk about communism, but elements of communism um, are really about uplifting everybody, right? 
we don't need to have everybody poor, right? And if community comes together, we can uplift everybody. So, um, you know, a lot of films in the 1930s tend to reflect these type of values rather than competing with somebody and getting pleasure off people struggling, right? So the, again, there's a major cultural shift happening during this period. <clears throat> And, um, you know, certain industries are, are kind of afraid of this, right? You know, business leaders are angered by these type of messages, by, you know, brother, can I spare a dime type messages um, or shows that kind of promote that. So just to give you an example, you know, uh, business leaders uh, and, and even some um, local governments try to blacklist uh, some of this music because they felt um, that it went against the American economic system. Uh, again, they, they see it as threatening to, to, the, to capitalism. And if anything, they're just critiquing it and, and the problems with it, right? So yeah, they try to ban it from, from Broadway and from the radio and people still found way, ways to listen to it. So in conclusion, what do we learn? We find that America was struggling right um with this concept of individualism particularly because this was a global depression right it, it was not their fault that they had lost their job it was out of their hands it wasn't like an individual thing but rather something that was out of their their control right um but like any event right americans become resourceful and they survive and they struggle and and they go on right and in doing so, Americans, um, the American culture reflects these struggles through music, through food, through fashion, through cinema. Um, and there is this hope at the end of the tunnel, right? There is a sense of optimism that um, eventually we come out of by the late 30s and really into uh, World War II, right? Uh, and I quickly want to address these last two things that I have here. So... Uh, as a historian, I really enjoy watching, you know, uh, something visual, right? That you could see what life was, might have been like in the Great Depression. And I have two movies here. Um, if you like movies, these are two good movies. They're, they're pretty old, but they're still really good movies. One of them is called Cinderella Man, which is based on a true story. And uh, you can read up on it, but, you know, watch the film and it does a great job addressing life during the Great Depression. But one of my favorite ones, and we actually have it at the library, it's called King of the Hill. And it's about this young little boy who is struggling during the Great Depression. And he, um, uh, this one has, because it's done in the 1990s, it does have that individualism type of argument. But uh, it has some actors that are popular at this moment, or maybe a few years ago, that they were kids when this movie came out. So uh, check these two films out. Again, they, they, they're really good movies and they're entertaining and it gives you a, a visual representation of the Great Depression. Okay, we'll stop it there and um, hope you feel like you learned something. <laughs>